Okay. Well, tēnā koutou katoa and welcome all. Um, now, this uh, title might suggest that Ketamarai has been lost, which is not the case. But some details about all the marae that made up Ketamarai, their locations, and what remains beneath the ground today were unknown. Now, I've been an archaeolog the archaeologist for the straightening of State Highway 3 and related works near Normanby. Um, I'm not sure if um, you've been down that way recently. You might notice that instead of doing this uh, weird sort of uh, zigzag across the railway, it, the road now runs straight. It's these works that I'm going to be talking about. But in order to work out what might be affected by these works, I've done a bit of an investigation and using a range of techniques. So the techniques are as on the screen, so geomagnetism, archaeology, tradition, and history. And I'll start with the history. Right, and... No, hang on. There we go. So the treaty opened the door to Pākehā settlement, as I'm sure you will all know. At that time, there were some 800, sorry, 80,000 Māori and only 2,000 Europeans in the country. Over the next 20 years, the Māori population dropped to some 60,000, whereas the Europeans rose to 90,000. While this was occurring, Ketamarai, near present-day Normanby, was becoming a productive area. According to the missionaries, Māori were growing wheat, establishing flour mills, raising cattle and pigs, trading foodstuffs to the Australian goldfields, and becoming prosperous entrepreneurs. They had an Anglican church, Wesleyan chapel, and built meeting houses, including Kumia Maita Waka, which is now at Ngārongo Marae, one kilometre northeast of Norman Bay. So you can see by those list of things, nearly all of them are, were Māori embracing the, the, the new things that have been brought in by, by Europeans. However, there was an increasing pressure on Māori to sell their land. To, the new, to these new settlers. So in 1853, uh, Ngati Rua Nui, Ngati Rauru, Ngati Rua Hine, and Taranaki, all tribes of South Taranaki, met near Ketamarai, and they sealed an anti-land selling compact. By 1857, they had fortified three of their marae at Ketamarai, and abandoned the church and the chapel. So this was clearly a time of retrenchment, understandable retrenchment. The First and Second Taranaki Wars were largely fought around Waitara, New Plymouth to the north. Uh, but Shute's campaign affected all of Taranaki, and that's where the detail comes in at Ketamarai. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, there's no illustration of any of the Ketamarai Pa, but this nearby Pa of Keteonatea, drawn by Reverend Richard Taylor in 1857, i.e. the same year that those other Pa had been fortified, um, it may be very similar. It's defended by a line of palisades with no obvious earthworks such as ditches and banks like many of the gunfighter par sites had. So um, basically it's a village with a palisade around it. Right, so in December 1865, Major General Trevor Shute, to give him his full name, uh, determined to march from Honganui to New Plymouth via an inland path through the bush east of Mount Taranaki. And he had with him a force of 500 men. And they had artillery and horses. Shute's expedition 
burnt and destroyed all in their path. On the 11th of January, 1866, he attacked Otapawa Pa. And this is an illustration of that event uh, by Gustavus von Tempsky. And this was said to be the strongest fortification the forces encountered, and it's located some 10 kilometers to the southeast of Ketamarai, and resulted in the death of 30 defenders and 11 British. And the scene here is of probably them carting away Lieutenant Colonel Hazard, who also was killed at this event. Right. So four days later, on 15th of January, 1866, the troops attacked Ketamarai. And Shoup describes the place as consisting of four palisaded pa behind a line of stockading and earthworks. When the troops arrived, they found the place had been abandoned. So they burnt all the pa, the houses, the cultivations, the pigs, the poultry, carts, and any other destructible things, which is a quote from a local newspaper. The flour mill was also destroyed and Seven villages and other par sites of Ngarua Hine and Ngarua Nui, Ngati Rua Nui, including Keteonete that I showed you before, all of those in the surrounding area were also destroyed. The meeting house, Kumia Maitawaka, was charred but not totally burnt. It was later moved and repaired. The troops then continued along the inland path. And in this painting, also by von Temsky, the start of the march is shown, which must be near Ketimarai. Where are we going? Oh. So the result of all this war was confiscation. The surveyors were sent in to survey land blocks and the new roads as part of the confiscation of most of the fertile coastal plain, an area of some 2 million acres or 800,000 hectares. This map shows part of the confiscation map with the edge of the forest in brown, which is this line here going around. So all above and in this way, that way from that line is all forest. Now, limited efforts were made to compensate non-combatant Māori, but only two crown grants were issued near Ketamarai. Now, one that you can hardly see is the Tarana block, which is a small block of land just in there, which was essentially under, under forest. And the other one was this large Tiratiru Moana block, um, which again is mainly in forest, apart from one small bit there, which is where Ketamarai is shown. Now, Tarana was notable as being the location of the incident that set off the Third Taranaki War. In 1868, Military settlers around Normanby cut timber on the block and continued, despite frequent warnings, that this was Māori land. Three settlers were killed. And this phase of the war were based solely around South Taranaki. And Māori were led by Rifa Titokawaru, and he had been based at Mutu Otamanu, which is up here, there. Um, And that's seven kilometers to the northwest of Ketimarai. By the following year, Titokawaru had uh, reconquered much of South Taranaki, but then withdrew, and an uneasy peace developed, during which time Normanby and other towns became established. And just to finish off the, the war, uh, the Fourth Taranaki War 
began uh, between uh, 1878 and 1880 was based in Pariaka, uh, which is 50 kilometers to the northwest, and ended, as I'm sure everyone's aware, of the eventual destruction of the village, jailing of the leaders, and it basically sealed the fate of Taranaki Māori to own largely the forested hill country with settlers occupying the cleared fertile flats that Māori had cleared over the preceding several hundred years. So, what and where was Kete Marae? Now, traditional accounts of Arau Kuku Hapu say that Kete Marae was literally a basket of settlements, not one place. And Shute's description of four pa fits this. All accounts are that Ketamurai was in a clearing in the forest at the southern end of the inland track for Kahurangi, which is now where Mountain Road is. And it was this track that Shute took on 1866. The confiscation map that I showed you before marks Ketamurai in a clearing. Um, but the scale is not good enough to really translate that onto a modern map on the ground today. So we'll look, I look for other sources and this rather tantalizing map, which is a bit hard to see with all the black lines across it, but um, this is a, a surveyor map uh, and they were surveying the route of a road, which is this line through here. And they've marked Kitimarai clearing and there's an edge of bush. However, um, the survey book that this belongs to, the, the adjacent pages are missing, so we can't actually work out what road this is on, and it doesn't seem to fit with anything else, so um, it's more tantalizing than anything. However, there were other plans which were more useful and from those, I've constructed this plan. Um, so, now how much can you say? Yeah, that's all right. So, additional historical research suggests that Ketimarai Pa that shoot attacked in 1866 might have included Ngārongo up here. This is the, the site of the current uh, Marae, Orokoifoi which was where the mill was, the flour mill, and there's um, remains of the flour mill that have been recorded, Hutingapa, which I'll talk about more about, and Matariki, which is often said to be in um, Normanby itself, and I think, judging by the, the, the best the maps that I have, it was probably in the northern part of, of Normanby. Now, um, the hole was said to be enclosed by a palisade with stockades. Oh, palisade and earthworks, sorry. So this stockade here, that line, is actually to the west of State Highway 2. Uh, sorry, State Highway 3. I'm also working in um, uh, the Bay of Plenty at the moment and alongside State Highway 2, so I get my numbers confused occasionally. Um, so I think the, the stockade was, was further west because this whole new route of the state highway has been examined and no, nothing was found. And certainly if there'd been a major stockade and uh, ditches and banks, it would have been found. So I think it lies, uh, as I say, to the west of State Highway 3 um, and is still to be found probably under a paddock. Um, the map, this map that I've constructed also shows the clearing of Ketamarai. I hope you can see that, the sort of the green line with the clearing. So there's a green line that comes around here, up and around there. That is, is the clearing. Uh, my best construction based on a whole bunch of other survey maps. And this is as it probably was in 1866. And this map also shows some of the other pa that were destroyed in Shute's campaign, including Otapawa down the bottom here, 
and Kete Onotea. Um, and this is the uh, my suggested route that he took after uh, destroying Otapawa. So, from all of this, we now have a reasonable idea of at least some of the power and the possible locations of others. So now we go to what remains of them today. Now here I'm using archaeology. And so when State Highway 3 was realigned to change all those sharp bends that uh, people were falling off, unfortunately, um, the, uh, the whole route was, was monitored uh, by uh, another group, Northern Archaeology, and especially by Annetta Sutton of that group. So she monitored the works, and when they came just to the, almost the end of the route, which is where the overbridge um, was still at that time, um, uh, the, all of this suddenly appeared. Now, it may not be quite clear, but you might be able to see a line, a brown line through here. And that's actually a line of palisades. And there's some more brown splodges here, which is another line of palisades. And this dark area in the middle, it's, it's actually charcoal, not, um, not soil. Um, that is probably a burnt house. There were other features there as well that they found. Um, with all of this burning, the question was, is this one of the Ketimurai Pa burnt by uh, General Shute? Now, um, this is sort of a little bit technical now. The, the Heritage New Zealand authorities only last for five years, and this one was coming to an end, the one that uh, Northern Archaeology had for this work. And so because they'd sort of come suddenly upon something that was clearly very significant, um, a decision was made to, to call a halt there, and NZTA applied for another authority um, for the remainder of the works, including this PAR site. And that's where I came into the picture. But while this was happening, while there was a hiatus between sort of changing authorities and applying and doing assessments and getting new archaeologists on board. The decision was to put fabric over this. So nothing was done with that. Just fabric was laid on top and soil on top of that. Now, when I began, there was discussions about what, what was going to happen to the power. And then said Tia decided that the best option was to bury the path with more fabric, soil, and aggregate and build the road up on top of it. But this was not the only land that was to be defected, affected by the remaining works. It wasn't just that bit that I've showed you. So I... Um, I now turn to geomagnetism. And, ah, oh, Hans has almost disappeared behind a stripe. Um, <laughs> right. Now, geomagnetism is one of the suite of geophysical techniques used by archaeologists to see below the ground without disturbing it. As Kelvin said, um, you know, things are disappearing all the time. And it's much better to try and preserve them for the future rather than destroying them. So, um, uh, and in this case, geomagnetism is the ideal tool uh, because this is an area that's been burnt and ge geomagnetism picks up variations in the magnetism of the soil. When something is burnt, the soil um, gets hot, obviously, and any iron particles in the soil turn towards the north point at the time. And that might be different to the north point when the rest of the soil developed, which is volcanic ash from the mountain. 
Um, so it comes up really clearly because of that. So it's very good for picking up areas of burning. And this is Hans Stiebarder here. He's got a machine with two probes, and he walks up and down, endlessly up and down, and creates a map, which we'll show you. We got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, so that one, that photograph was showing him doing this northern strip. He also went over the area where that previous uh, excavation had unearthed the pa, which was this piece through here, but he expanded it much, um, much wider because there was going to be a temporary road put in there, so I wanted to make sure that we had the full width of the pa there. Uh, so that was under the um, northern approach road. This was under the southern part of the approach road, and then he also did further work in the adjacent farmland, railway land, and alongside Walls Court Place. So there were a whole lot of bits of geomagnetic surveying. In the process, he found um, lines which he's traced over as pale blue. So these are the palisades these are the palisades coming down. We've lost stuff here with the railway, but and then coming in here. And um, uh, traditional accounts had that uh, the Udupa, which is the zone, Udupa uh, uh, cemetery here, currently here on Walls Court Place, that that was in a corner of the par, so it must have come out here and then back in around somewhere. Right, so we, we haven't got all the bits, but we've got a large amount of it, and which suggests that the power extended over an area of some 30,000 square metres, so it's a big place. What was also uh, Hans found in his geomagnetic survey is the upper edge of a stream here. So... This was the stream um, that uh, was formed one edge almost of the par site, uh, and also found some other storage pits here. Oh, I should have said, sorry, that the orange blobs are either houses or storage pits, and these little red dots are probably fires, individual fires, hearths, or, um, uh, or hangi pits. But here, in this corner, there seem to be some features outside. And then additional research showed that, in fact, there was a kainga there that was um, existed uh, in the area from about 1880 to 1910. And that probably extended further out into the, what is now fields, because uh, sometimes there were several hundred people living there. Okay, now, okay, so this is another way of looking at pretty much the same thing. Um, and this is sort of trying to work out what survives today of these important places. So I've got here the red, big red blob is the, the par site, Hüttinge. Uh, and I've got it dashed out here because I'm not quite sure where it goes, but it probably goes something like that. Here is the Kainga, this green area, which, as I say, expands out over this way towards me. Uh, and there's the Udupa, which has been given, um, it's been drawn in various sizes and shapes over the years. I'm not quite sure how far the burials actually extend. But, and then we've got the stream, the way to stream, and this would be, would have been a typically um, uh, Taranaki stream with sort of steep sides and a flat swampy bottom with the, the water flowing through it. 
And it was probably very important for the people of the Pa because there might have been springs alongside it, either from here or possibly from there, um, that they could get fresh drinking water. And it also provided a, a sort of a barrier, a defensive barrier to some extent. Now, the works that I was involved in included not only these roads, but also Walls Court Place was, was modified, was widened, um, and there were some drainage works through the edge of the, uh, the current reserve and playing fields. In, we knew that uh, the Norman B. Redoubt, uh, built in 1879, uh, was located somewhere in, that, in those playing fields. We weren't quite sure where. So Hans did another geomagnetic survey there and came up with this shape, which is a beautiful shape of a redoubt with two bastions, just, just very typical, very perfectly shaped. And obviously, um, it's well away from any works that were related to drains and things down here. Um, these other little pink things down there are possibly some other historic uh, features. We're not quite sure what they are, but it doesn't matter. They can stay there. Um, and, uh, yeah, at least now council are aware, so if they ever do any works in, in the reserve, um, in the playing field, they'll know to certainly avoid the redoubt altogether, but um, if they're coming close to one of these other features, they will need an authority from Heritage New Zealand in order to, to do anything. The stream, as I say, is an important feature. It um, was first uh, drained, so it was straightened and drained to allow for the roads to go in, um, and then has been almost filled up apart from one little end of it now, um, but you, and there's also a rest area which I will show you later, which is actually, you know, yeah, is just in here. Right. So, as my question is, what remains? Now, if this works right, I hope. No. There we go. Yeah. So if you look at just the, the red area now, we know that part of the park was destroyed by the original route of Walls Court Place, which was about around 1870. Um, no. And then it, the Walls Court Place was moved, rearranged, in about 1910, and it did this sort of dogleg thing, and that was to allow for the extension of yards and things related to the um, railway. Um, and yeah, railway because there was an expansion of um, of the railway at that time. And then, uh, whoops, then there was the railway itself. This was 1880. So that quarried a channel through the par. And then this big chunk of dirt was quarried out to provide uh, the embankments for the overbridge for the railway when the new road, when that road went in, in uh, 1936. So you can see from that picture that a lot of the, the par has been damaged and destroyed. To the west, over here, this big area, that's all buried now, and the road drives over the top of it. There's a bit here where there was the northern embankment, a little bit here, which was part of railway land, and probably some bits in through around here which are in farmland. So the power, parts of the power still do exist um, and obviously contain important information. But 
the fact that we know where it is now means that any works in those areas um, will know that um, in, preferably they have to be protected from any uh, damage. Uh, but if there is something that just has to be done, uh, we can, it, it, it will need an authority and proper uh, investigation. Now, the other three pa that were part of, Matari, uh, part of Ketimirai, Matariki, maybe under the, the houses and backyards in northern Normanby, but the others appear to be in farmland, and the remains may still lie hidden beneath the pasture. Now, here is the new road and it's rising very gently over the top of Hutingapa. Hutingapa is also nearest the camera. I'm standing on um, um, Walls Court Place, looking over to the Maunga. Um, and I think now we can ask, what is the significance of all this work? What is the significance of these findings? Well. I think, firstly, it throws a light on a very important history of the Normanby area and Taranaki as a whole. And it certainly supports the hapu traditional accounts, which is really important for them. And it suggests also that there is more that lies beneath the pasture, the pasture that appears to be totally featureless. Today, there is a memorial rest area beside State Highway 3 at Normanby with interpretation by the hapu that commemorates these events. And this is the representation of Kumia Maitawaka, which on a clear day outlines Taranaki, but it was cloudy when I <laughs> took it, as it often is. But the exposure and burial of part of Hutingapa beneath State Highway 3 has been a source of mamai, of pain, for Arau Kuku Hapu. And I hope that my report, which is based on this work, which reveals its history and places it back on the landscape, helps ease this pain a bit and is also a vehicle for educating rangatahi, the next generation. Sorry. Now finally, this is not my work alone by any means. And I've mentioned many people. And I'm very pleased to see that um, both Clive and Mahuru who've, who've supported the work and been really, really interested in it. Um, and other members of the hapu are also here tonight. Um, I presented a version of this presentation to the marae um, when the, um, the commemorative um, rest area was opened. Um, and they um, helpful, helpfully corrected some of my errors, which I really appreciate. Um, NZTA uh, paid for it, and fair enough, they were destroying some of the history, the important history of New Zealand. South Taranaki District Council also had an input uh, regarding Walls Court Place. And then MWH Global, Downers, and Burgess and Crowley were all the guys that put together the, um, the, the, the design of the works uh, and actually drove the machines. Uh, Heritage New Zealand and Catherine Hurring were also important partners in, in getting this. Uh, underway, as were Annette Sutton and Michael Taylor of Archaeology North, who g gave me their information. Alistair Nicol of Land Information New Zealand gave me that tantalizing um, uh, survey map, but also a lot of others. And Kelvin Day um, is, is great value because I often send him sort of curious little emails and say, have you got this map? 
do you know this person? Um, have you got a, an aerial? So he was very valuable as well. And David Rudd, who's a consultant who's very good on things military. Uh, Jaden Harris analysed ceramics and glass that were, uh, we found along Walls Court Place and near the reserve. Uh, they all proved to be 20th century stuff, but could have been earlier and needed doing, needing, needed analysing. Hans Dieter Bader, I've mentioned before, with the Geomag, and he was helped by Craig Reedy and Annie Rose Ferguson, who um, moved tapes and um, ropes for him. And finally, Lynette Williams, who proofreads all my work, but of course, any mistakes here are my own. So thank you very much. Kwa